but I'm kind of a, a NASA nerd. So um, please be quiet while he speaks, and he's going to open it up for questions. I hope y'all have some, because I know I will. I am so happy to introduce um, Captain, Air Force Captain, and astronaut from Apollo missions and the shuttle missions, Fred Hayes. Uh, just to get you uh, where I've been in life, uh, I'm trying to think back. I graduated from high school. A senior from high school graduated in Biloxi, Mississippi in 1950. I see somebody saying, ooh, yeah, that's a long time ago. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, I, uh, I was in school like you, and uh, I'd say for the trail I followed uh, to be an astronaut involved a lot of schooling, a lot of training. Uh, from uh, high school, I went actually to a community college for two years, and I uh, was thinking of becoming a journalist. I got interested in the summers. I worked for a local newspaper as like a cub reporter. And I worked on the high school uh, newspaper, and then junior college, I actually was editor one year of the school newspaper. And uh, what changed my, really, my course in life was the Korean War. That's one some of you probably don't remember. That one is a couple of wars back. Uh, but at any rate, uh, it was going on, and I decided to serve my country. And the only program I could get into uh, to to become an officer. My father had always uh, within a Navy ship type person, always uh, encouraged me if I went into the military to get a commission, to become a commissioned officer. And the only program that fit with two years of college and the age I was at the time was the Naval Aviation Cadet Program. And this involved flying airplanes and learning to fly aboard an aircraft carrier. Now you have to realize, I had never been in an airplane in my life at that time, not even sitting in one on the ground. So it's kind of what you do sometimes when you're 18 and don't think too far ahead of what you're getting into. But it turned out it was one of these things uh, that after I finished free flight, and uh, the, fir the first time I flew with a fellow named Hank Chenard, and I uh, got airborne and looked looked at the earth from even fairly low altitude, uh, 5,000 feet maybe, it was like magic, magical to me. And uh, that, that, one, that experience just told me, uh, my, I have a new career. I'm not sure what it's going to be, in every, but it's going to be in aviation. You have to realize there was no space program. So I'm talking about 1953-54. Uh, so I, I said, I'm going to be involved with airplanes somehow. I would, didn't have a clear path of, in mind, a goal in mind. But it's going to be when I finish this uh, military tour. And I had then uh, four years uh, after becoming a naval aviator in the Marine Corps, actually. I was in two different Marine fighter squadrons. Uh, when I got out, by the time I got out, I uh, was thinking about what next. And I decided I wanted to be a test pilot. That was a good thing to use with the, the skills and uh, experience I developed at that time. And uh, of course, a test pilot uh, needs to be an engineer. Because most people don't think of it, if you see movies, if you just think of a test pilot that sits around uh, playing cards or AC Ducey or checkers or something, and then one day the, the new airplane's ready to fly and they call you up and say, yeah, let's go fly the airplane. Well, it's not that way. You, a test pilot is a part of the design team, uh, heavily involved with human factors, uh, with reliability engineering, uh, worrying about the, the systems and particularly contingencies when things don't work. So you, you need an engineering degree. So I went back to school at the University of Oklahoma. Maybe I shouldn't say that here with most of you Texans. <laughs> uh, I went to school at the University of Oklahoma and got a degree in aeronautical engineering. And uh, I looked around then at different companies I might join, but my squadron commander uh, of the Oklahoma National Guard I was in at the same time, it was a fighter squadron, and that's how I got the Air Force. I traded my commission from Marine Corps to the Air Force. 
and he recommended I apply to NACA because at this time there was still not a space program. Uh, so it, it was called NACA and again heavily involved in airplane uh, testing and development. And uh, so I applied at uh, several centers but the only one that had an opening was uh, in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, Lewis was then called Lewis Research Center. It's now named Glenn after John Glenn first astronaut who went into orbit. And I really, I really followed uh, in a trail of Neil Armstrong by about three years, because Neil started at Lewis. Then he had moved on to Edwards Air Force Base, uh, NASA's what I call premier flight test operation and flight research center. And he got to fly the X-15. Uh, and I did follow him about three years later. He went into the astronaut program and the Gemini program, it had now become a space program. And uh, I followed him and I moved to Edwards as well, into testing airplanes uh, there. One time Neil came back, it was interesting, he came back uh, and visited uh, back at Flight Research Center and uh, sitting around kind of said, what's it like being an astronaut? Well, Neil, <laughs> it's kind of funny, Neil said, well, you sit in a lot of meetings, you sit in the simulator a lot, and it's not much good flying. Because he was thinking it back to our flight test days when we flew many different kinds of airplanes. I know we flew every day, at least during the work week. So uh, I had to think hard about whether I should even apply to be an astronaut. And, uh, but I decided the Apollo program had come on, and it had the possibility of a great adventure to go to the moon. And I said, well, if I sit here at Edwards having all this fun, uh, I'm not going to get to go to the moon. I had no chance. So I, I applied and was accepted into the astronaut program in 1966. Now that's probably before many of you were born at that time even. But 1966, I joined the astronaut program. And I, I did get to serve uh, my first uh, mission assignment was Apollo 8. I was the backup uh, lunar module pilot. It was a mission that did not have a lunar module. That's a landing craft. You land on the moon. It had it just a capsule because it had been a, uh, a mission that had changed from having a limb in an Earth orbital test to not lose slip schedule and keep ahead of things. NASA took a great risk and decided on that mission to, uh, that was the second mission second mission we flew in Apollo to go to the moon with just the command module. And that was done in Apollo 8. Interesting, the backup crew I was with for six months was Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. We were the backup crew on 8. Uh, unfortunately, Mike Collins, who recently passed away just a week ago, last week, uh, Mike uh, had been ill with a neck injury and they had moved, removed him from the Apollo 8 crew, the prime crew, to fly, and Jim Lowell had moved up from the backup crew, which is how I got that assignment. And Mike got well, so he got healthy, and, uh, and Deke put him back in the prime slot now for Apollo 11. So I had to serve another backup assignment, and I was the backup uh, lunar module pilot for the first landing mission uh, with uh, Ken Mattingly, and Jim Lowell was the commander. So then came our turn, because normally the way things went, you went three missions. In other words, if you flew 11 as a backup, you would normally fly 14. Well, again, as uh, things worked out, that then, uh, which was the only time that did not follow suit. Uh, as it turned out, the, the crew for Apollo 14 that had been designated, because the, the, the uh, crew before, Settle had left the program, and Al Shepard and Stu Rusa, along with Ed Mitchell, but Stu Rusa and, and Al uh, Shepard had never trained for a mission. So headquarters, I think, overrode uh, Dee Slayton and uh, decided they should get more training time. So they asked my commander, uh, Jim Lovell, if he would be willing to fly earlier on Apollo 13. And of course, Jim raised his hand, maybe you want to fly as soon as you can. 
So that's how we ended up uh, with Apollo 13, or it was horrific. If everything had followed the normal process, we would have flown 14. I'm going to show you now some, uh, I think, pictures of, uh, better than my talking so much, uh, to see about this, uh, this mission. This was a plaque that we were uh, to have left on the moon uh, when we, after we landed, which it turned out we did not. Uh, the original crew uh, is shown here. That's with Jim Lovell on the left, Ken Manning Lake, and myself. That were trained to fly this mission. Now we had a we had a virus threat. It happened to be uh, German measles. That's a virus. And then the week before launch, uh, doctors were taking our blood samples about every other day and gone gone having them tested. And two and a half days before launch, we changed out a crewman. Jack Schweiger replaced Ken Manning. Now you might think that's pretty bizarre, and, and uh, some people might question that. But the way we trained, uh, we trained prime and backup trained roughly the same amount. Every day we normally flip who had the simulators in the morning, who had them in the afternoon. You both went on the geology trips. So you were you were really you really could have changed out an entire crew the week of launch, and it wouldn't have mattered uh, because both were trained to go fly the mission. And uh, but it was kind of a uh, obviously an emotional uh, change. Ken was now geared, butterflies building up. I'm not really really going to fly, and now to be yanked two and a half days before launch after all the work to get ready uh, was downheartening for him, obviously. This I'm showing you now some training scenes. Uh, we had uh, about a, uh, we supposed to have a year of training uh, because of the workload in Apollo. We probably had about uh, seven, seven, eight months of that training. But some of it included survival training. This was desert. We did this in the uh, south uh, east corner of the state of Washington, which if you think of Washington, at least the coastal area is pretty green. But if you go inland a ways, it's uh, desert. This is another favorite one of, uh, and this is jungle survival in Panama. The uh, shorter fellow in the center there is the chief of a tribe, I think the Choya Indians that live there. And we actually uh, visited that tribe in there where they had their thatched huts with a one hole in the ceiling. They kept a fire going 24 hours a day. They had logs in the center feeding into the fire because everything in the jungle is wet. It rains all but about four hours of the day. So uh, we, we, had a, we camped out there, uh, put us out there as a, as a crew, three of us to represent the crew in the command capsule. I had uh, uh, a couple with me, and we, they gave us one parachute door, and we had all the stuff out of our survival kit from the capsule to use, and that was it. So we, uh, we lived out there for uh, four days, and on our way out, visited this tribe. Kind of a funny story, this chief, uh, as a reward for this training he did for many, most all the crews that were training for Apollo, uh, they invited him and flew him to Washington, well, he flew him first to Kennedy to see an Apollo launch. Now, he was kind of impressed with all the noise, but the fire, you know, he had seen fire, it wasn't too unique to him. The really shocker for him was in Washington, D.C., they took him to Washington and the NASA headquarters, and he went into that building and went into an elevator. The elevator doors closed, he felt a little movement, and then the doors opened, and he's somewhere else. I mean, to him, that was like Scotty uh, beat me up. I mean, he, he, he was just a dumbfounded about that experience. We've got to fly airplanes for training. But like Neil said, it wasn't fun flying. We used these things more like taxi cabs to fly down to the Cape or fly to factories uh, for vehicle tests, that kind of thing. Occasionally, I'd get out and do an acrobatic flight just out over the Gulf, uh, have a little fun. We did an enorm enormous amount of geology training. Now, I had absolutely no experience in geology until training for this mission. All total, I uh, trained for four missions, actually. After 13, I served as another backup as the backup commander to John Young on 16. 
All total, I did 31 geology field trips uh, that are training for those missions. So I felt I became a, at least a pretty avid observer, field geologist, uh, to do the right uh, sampling protocol to also look at the stegopy and vary where we might sample that kind of thing, which is what your role was if you landed on the moon. And this showed Jim Lowell and I in uh, one of the exercises. This is in Hawaii. Another kind of interesting uh, rig they uh, had was the, the centrifuge at the Johnson Space Center is a cab that revolves around a big round hill and, and depending on how fast they revolve that depends on how many G's you feel. And they can run it up to a fairly high G level. In fact, for Apollo 8, we worried about the entries. Uh, could you still see the instrument panel and control uh, where Navigation was a little bit maybe of a question mark that we get if we got steep. Uh, the, the structural limit on the capsule was about 18 G's. So we flew some runs up to 14 G's in that centrifuge you know, with a little test uh, scheme of following the needle on the instrument panel in the captain's capsule at the end of the arm swinging around. But it said, well, we'll jury rig it, and they had this hoist arrangement on that uh, same a plug thing that revolved, and now gave us support to, in essence, make it a sort of 1-6-G. Although not truly not realistic, because you're feeling you're being pulled up in the pressure suit, so it wasn't quite the same. But to practice uh, walking around, to practice bunny hopping, that sort of thing. On our mission, I was going to be the first one to use this electric drill to get a sample, a core sample. Here I was training, this is at Kennedy Space Center, using this electric uh, drill apparatus. And we had to worry about contingencies. Uh, this was uh, in a water tank with the capsule here you see upside down. Because that could happen if uh, you splash down and shoot to one where uh, uh, cut loose soon enough, the capsule could flip upside down. Now this is kind of a double failure because we also had a balloon you could inflate on the side that would write it, make it right side up. So you had to have a double failure. First of all, the chutes didn't get uh, rid of soon enough. Plus, you had a failure in that balloon. So we had to practice coming out the, from the other side while you're upside down in the capsule in the water. And another one recovering from, uh, actually, we did an exercise out in the Gulf where we were in a capsule uh, taken out by a ship for a uh, egress exercise. Another trainer, I did not get to fly until the only commanders got to fly this vehicle. It's a lunar landing training vehicle. Kind of a weird machine. Uh, you're in a little cab in the front uh, that gives you a window view as if you were looking out the lunar module. It's kind of a, a triangular a window. The vehicle is powered primarily by that stinger you see sticking out of the middle there. That's a jet engine. On each corner are small hydrogen peroxide rocket motors that you control attitude with. And I flew this thing 22 times as a backup commander on 16. And it, it, uh, it really did give you a realism, including uh, uh, stress, adrenaline, almost every time flying this thing, because you're always critical on fuel to get it on the ground. And we lost three of them. We had three ejections. Neil Armstrong ejected out of one. And I think NASA management at the time uh, wanted to cancel and not have the vehicle for training because of that hazard. But Neil talked them up. He said, this, is the, this puts you in the right uh, environment for the stress you'll feel, uh, the pressure you'll feel. And it's essential if you're going to pay all that money to send somebody to go land on the moon, this, this trainer you need it. So they continued it. But we had another ejection. Uh, Stu President ejected at about 500 feet when the electrical system failed. And that was a pretty normal ejection. Niels was pretty close to the ground. And uh, Joe Granny uh, ejected from a, a third one. So we ended up with only two of them left in the program. And that just shows that everyone, this was at, actually at Edwards Air, Air Force Base in the initial testing of that vehicle. These are the vehicles we used to the moon. This is the command and service module. That, that capsule uh, that you think of is that blue 
shrouded uh, section at the top. The lower half, uh, the big larger piece, is the service module that contains your fuel cells for primary electrical power and the uh, propellants uh, for a, that one engine you had, this SPS engine. And the lunar module, a very unusual vehicle, uh, kind of ugly. Most pilots, when they first see it, uh, say it's an ugly machine because it doesn't look very aerodynamic. And it doesn't need to be. It was meant to only fly in vacuum. In fact, a lot of systems were, uh, you could only operate in vacuum. Uh, the cabin fans, if we tried to run them in testing on the ground, we had to time how long they were on because of the thick air here on the ground, around 5 psi, normally you were at the flight, uh, you could overheat the motors. Uh, the uh, electronics, uh, something like a VHF system and a chamber test, you couldn't turn them on and operate to you about 65,000 feet or they would arc. So it's really a vehicle that was built uh, to be in uh, vacuum space and it was an extreme weight challenge with this vehicle to be able to pull off the landing mission. It was a two parts, it had an upper stage and a bottom half. This actually was the, the only time you had a crew uh, manually do a launch. They, you, you actually left the decent stage sitting on the moon, and six of them still are sitting on the moon today. We rode this vehicle, the Saturn V. Um, it's a big, big machine. If you laid the rocket on its side, how I many have been to JFC, Johnson Space Center, and seen the Saturn V? Okay, well you see it's pretty pretty big. If you lay it like it on the side, like it is in that building, it would cover an entire football field, plus both end zones, plus three feet. So that's the, the length of this thing. It's three stages, the first, second, and third stage. Uh, sitting in a shroud right above that is the lunar module. This has to be protected. If, you know, if it was exposed to air, it would probably tear it apart during launch, so it's, it's protected. And the service module and capsule are right up on the tippy top. This is the launch morning, and uh, I'm being uh, checked out by the suit deck here, and uh, to make sure my suit doesn't have any leaks, i get ready just before we uh, went out to the pad. And this is the major scene of us uh, going out to the vehicle. Now they later had a much better vehicle for shuttle days. This vehicle was like a, almost like a converted milk wagon. and painted up fancy. It had some benches in it there you could sit on. And you could hook up to intercom so you could talk to the uh, suit decks or, or where you needed to. We're carrying those canisters because we've already started pre-breathing oxygen. So that capsule we were going in operated at 100% oxygen. That allowed us to operate at 5 psi, which to your lungs puts the partial pressure of the oxygen the same as you are in this room, where you got 20% oxygen, the rest mostly nitrogen. So that, and that, uh, that again saved weight and the structural sense for the pressurized cabin. Now this is us being stowed aboard. See, it's pretty cramped quarters, the three of us here. You can't see Jim Lovell, he's over to the left a little ways. But we're all uh, nestled into the uh, capsule at this time, we're getting ready to get the hatch closed, up on top, going through the rush, final rush uh, uh, launch countdown. And liftoff. The liftoff is uh, not a, a huge kick in the pants. Uh, I haven't flown a lot of airplanes. I've all, all told in my career I've flown 81 types of aircraft. And uh, fighters, uh, to that, the modern, more modern ones with afterburners, you feel more of a kick in the pants uh, you, when you kick it in the afterburner to head down the runway than you did in this, uh, this rocket. It's all, it was an all-liquid rocket. I think the shuttle people felt a bigger kick with the solids when they, when they looked lit. Uh, but the most unusual thing uh, from my airplane experience was the perky jerkiness of the ride. It was kind of, some people described it as a railroad car kind of halfway off the tracks. Uh, you have to think of those big engines. There were five engines. They each generate a million and a half pounds of thrust. A 
of eight and a half pounds, the four engines out of us could gimbal. So they could gimbal left and right, four and a half, and that kind of kept the thing steered to go in the right direction. But if you think of steering with that, that much thrust, just a very minute motion really was a, uh, exaggerated, and particularly since we were way up on top. So we were way up on top, so that, that motion was even more exaggerated to us way up there. And particularly most unusual was the left right. And the, the, uh, the couches you laid in weren't uh, fixed on the side. They had a little clearance so they could move. And that was for land water and land landings, potentially, to give you some, because they, they had actually things you could stroke. Uh, the thing you're laying in. So that was the most unusual of the ride. Now we had, uh, and when you got past the first stage, which only was two and a half minutes, uh, uh, then the ride was very smooth. The second stage and third stage both used the uh, S2 engine, which was a much smaller liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen engine, about 200,000 pounds thrust. And uh, the ride was pretty smooth, except in our second stage, at one point, the center light came on, we felt a vibration, uh, not for very long, but uh, that was Togo, a fluid instability in the fluid lines that caused a reduced and a reduction in chamber pressure, and particularly in the center engine, where the cruciform structure was on was actually moving. And uh, automatic, the system, uh, computer system and the booster automatically shut that engine off about two minutes early. Now that, you know, it was only, only the little vibration and the light on what, what I was most worried about, I think all of us were, was that does this mean we're going to be stuck with an earth orbit mission? <laughs> we're not going to get to go to the moon. And uh, very quickly, uh, Mission Control had figured the fuel and that we would have enough fuel to make the, use this third stage the second time to get us to the moon, because we had the longest, we had 12 minutes, a little over, getting in the lunar orbit, I mean the Earth orbit. So that was the longest uh, time of the program, getting in the orbit. We went around twice, and then the third end, uh, stage fired, accelerated us to 25,000 miles an hour, and we left the Earth heading outbound. Now this was the Earth orbit, we went around a couple of times, that's uh, Baja, California, if you're looking at there. Uh, I was too busy to really to look much out the window with things we were doing, getting cameras and film out and stuff. Now we're headed out away from the Earth on the way to the moon. And that's, that, that, these kind of views are, uh, again, what was most unusual for me in space flight was what you saw out the window. At uh, times uh, here, and, and uh, you're looking at the Earth there, and I don't know if you can see it, that, that's Baja, California again. Uh, and, and state of California and part of Mexico, you're seeing through those cloud patterns. But you can see the blue of the ocean, you can see land masses, and you can see cloud patterns very clearly. And of course it got pretty small as you headed on out toward the moon. And again, here we are in, in orbit now. You're looking over out of the limb, uh, limb lunar module window looking at its 100 pound thrusters, attitude thrusters, and that's the Earth you can see out there. Again, it seems so, so unbelievable. Here we are circling around the backside of the moon. This feature, that dark feature with a, sort of a little mountain in the center, is named Tsiolkovsky. Uh, it turns out the Russians had the first mission that went around the moon, and they shot pictures. So they got naming rights. And Tsiolkovsky was a uh, early Russian rocket designer, much like Dr. Goddard, here in the United States. So they named it uh, after him. Uh, most of the back side is quite different from the front side. You don't have as many of those dark areas as, you, as most of you. If you get to look at the moon all the time. It has these large dark features. Some people can even see a face in the moon. I don't quite be able to picture that where huge meteorites have hit probably many billions of years ago that have created those dark areas. Uh, they call seas or uh, Mars. The backside is more of this type of terrain, at least uh, the half we saw of the backside, not many dark areas at all. This is another one that's pretty smooth. This is called the Sea of Moscow, and the Russians named it. 
and another view on the back side as we went around. But it just seems unreal. You look out at this stuff, and I said, wow, am I really here looking at this? Here was what, after we separated, this is quite a few days later, after we separated the service module, that lower section you see there should look as shiny as that upper part. That's where one quarter of the spacecraft, the panel, blew off. And you still see some objects in there that's uh, clustered uh, fuel cells and some of the cryogenic tanks, one of which the oxygen tank too, had an electric short within the tank when the uh, uh, strike tires were stirred. They used a little A meter that stirs up the fluid that stratifies in zero G. To get a better quantity reading, that electric short occurred, pressure built up, the tank uh, scene, it really wasn't an explosion like you think of a shrapnel or anything. It just eventually a seam in the tank uh, separated a weak spot and filled that cavity with the gas coming out that developed enough pressure to blow that panel off. But it was quite a shock when it went. We, we felt the, and heard this loud bang, uh, the, the, the reverberations through the metal hulls, the vehicle thrusters started firing to try and hold attitude, that kind of thing. We struggled then for three days. Uh, the, the first critical thing was to get back in the right direction. Uh, when this happened, the explosion happened, we were not on the path that would have got us back to Earth. We had left free return. And so the first critical thing was to get on some path, circle in the moon, to get us back to our home. The first calculations they did and the first short maneuver we did, did that, but had us landing in the Indian Ocean by Madagascar. So they, uh, by, by the time we drifted on around to the back side of the moon, uh, the, the uh, FIDOs, flight dynamics officers uh, at work, scratched their heads some more and they figured out a, a way to get us back to our recovery force in the Pacific Ocean. And we did a very large maneuver we're using the, the landing engine, the engine we were going to land on the moon. We now had to use it because the mothership was completely shut off, completely shut down. Never had been ever planned to be shut down in flight. And so we used that engine for this very long burn that did several things for us. It cut 10 hours off the return, kind of like cutting the corner on the way home. It also uh, put us back into the, by the Samoan Islands, south of there, where we'd be near the recovery force, an Iwo Jima aircraft carrier, that had steamed back and had actually been on combat duty in Vietnam. And it was on its way home to San Diego and came by with the Navy divers to recover us. The third thing it did was put it in a pretty deep part of the ocean, because still in the lunar craft, in the Lenny craft, was a nuclear RTG power source that we would use to power the experiments that uh, we were going to put out on the moon, that we, we did on the ones that landed. In fact, I don't know, the RTGs probably could still be active today uh, if you can to try to uh, use them. Uh, but they worried about those things, uh, where they might end up back on Earth. So they want the uh, nuclear energy uh, the department wanted us to try to put, a, put, put the limb, the lunar module, when it entered into a deep part of the ocean. The entry itself was a little unusual because of the uh, situation of pre preserving power because the lunar module did not have fuel cells, it only had batteries. It had four of them in the descent stage, two of them in the ascent stage that normally you use for two days. If you planned it, that was the mission. Uh, we had to now figure out how to make them last four days. Uh, so we ended up powering way down to uh, roughly about 12 and a half amps on a 30 volt system. So if you can picture uh, you have a 300 watt light bulbs on two lamps at the end of your sofa, if you have both of those on at the high setting, that's about the power we were using. So it, it got very cold because the thermal blankets, which normally uh, control it for insulation, on the vehicle were, were designed to handle a low power setting of about 30, uh, 30 amps. So it got very cold. In fact, uh, the, the water tanks in the mothership, which was completely
completely shut down, froze the water tanks. They were found still frozen when they recovered the, that uh, spacecraft on board the aircraft carrier when they did the inspection. Lunar module, we had some things running, a few of some of the equipment. We had our three of us all huddled in there, had a body warmth. So it probably was somewhere in the mid-30s. We did not have adequate clothing, uh, so we, had, we couldn't use spacesuits uh, because spacesuits, if you put, got them on and did not have cooling air, you would have perspired. And uh, if you got out there to go to the bathroom, you'd have probably got pneumonia. Uh, and we, only had one set, we only had two sets of hoses in the lunar module for, to use for cooling, to hook up to the suit. And one of those was tied up with the lithium cartridge fix. How many of you have seen the movie Apollo 13? All right, we'll explain that pretty much in the movie. Uh, we, had, we had a problem with carbon dioxide building up. So we had the jury rig using the cartridges that cleanse the air of carbon dioxide from the mothership, but had to hook it up to one of the intake hoses on the limb system. So we only had one set of hoses to use if anybody wanted to get the suit. And our commander, Jim Lowell, decided, well, we're just going to all suffer together. So, so we got out all our spare underwear. I had on three sets of underwear. Unfortunately, it wasn't thermal underwear. And uh, to, to survive in that cold, I, did, I actually got a, a urinary tract infection and we had chills and fever about a day and a half out before entry. But the entry itself now, you can imagine with that cool and uh, operate at that low temperature and only the water separator working in the lunar module but well below its specifications water had built up everywhere in the lunar module that craft had no inner walls couldn't afford to wait so they had netting material just on the walls and you could look through it and see the plumbing and the wiring bundles and wiring runs and everywhere there was a turn in the plumbing or the wire bundles or at the connectors it was a glob of water and it formed because it could not get rid of the moisture just from our breathing out. When you breathe out, you're breathing out moisture every time you do. And uh, this command module, of Jack Swagger and I, this was the, the, actually the, to me, the worrisome part of the mission uh, when we got to that point was they had to create a power up procedure for the mothership. Like I said, the, the capsule had never been planned to be shut down. There was no procedure to power it up, except on the ground, on the launch pad. So they had to invent the procedure, and uh, they had about three and a half days to figure that out. They tested it a lot in simulators. They used other astronauts uh, to go test it and redline it and make changes. And uh, Jack and I got, Jack Swagger and I were going to do that procedure, and we got it about 13 hours before entry. They finally read it up. So Jack and I walked, verbally walked through it to kind of get the flow of the steps. And then they finally gave us a go to power up. So they didn't want to do it too early because we were going to using the three small batteries, that was all that was left in the command module, to get you through entry. 44 amp hour each. So they waited until two and a half hours before we're going to hit the air to go in there and power this vehicle up. So we had two and a half hours before we hit the interface, entry interface. And we crawled into that black dark, nothing on. Uh, first thing, we had a flashlight, and the first thing looking around was water was <coughs> all covering the instrument panel. So Jack got out a couple of towels and handed me one, and he had one, and we wiped off the instrument panel so we at least uh, read things. Uh, the, the first step in the procedure was on each side of the command module were two big panels with circuit breakers. They were manual. You could pull them out and push them in. And the first exercise was to push all those circuit breakers in. Well, Jack, smartly, thinking about all that water because he figured, well, it's behind the panels too. He said, I'll tell you what, he said, I'll give you a countdown and we'll, we'll push in, start in a row and push in six and stop. So we can now wait and smell if we smell any insulation burning. You might have, we might have an electric short. 
So that's the way we went through that activation, six circuit breakers at a time to get all those in. And fortunately, we did not have a short. The reasoning for that, I, I'll, I'll give credit uh, to, uh, again, a horrible accident. Apollo 1, for those who have not heard of it, was a mission where we lost three crewmen on the launch pad due to a fire erupting, erupting in the spacecraft. They died. There was a problem with wiring. So after that, uh, as part of the redesign and rework that was done on both vehicles, not just the command module, but also the lunar module, very strict wiring criteria was in, in, put in place. In fact, that's why you see LIM-2 in Smithsonian. For those who go to Washington, you see the lunar module 2. The second one, it was really supposed to fly the first all of mission. But with that rewiring protocol required, we knew we'd have to strip that vehicle. And the same schedule, we just pushed it aside and went to LEM-3 to fly that Apollo 9 mission. But it required very stringent protocol on the wiring runs, how, how often you had to have ties, uh, and all connectors were hermetically sealed with a material I think called Melkor. Uh, and so that kind of stringent requirement was done on wiring. And that's, I think, what saved us from having uh, that electrical shot. But the first part of entry, uh, power, incidentally, it powered up perfectly uh, normal. It had all the right places. It had what caution light would come on, which is always a problem. If you're out of configuration and you're powering up systems, you might accidentally cause a false light to come on. And that would stop you. Because you'd have to say, wow, what, why, why is that? But they had perfected that through the simulator runs as to what's, where in the steps that light would come on so we didn't have to slow down, we could press on. It got powered up, jack out alignment, uh, and we were set to, for entry. When we first hit the atmosphere, the thing you see is a white glow. It's kind of like maybe being inside of a neon light bulb, because the first, at the, at the, we're now moving it. 36,000 feet a second, 25,000 miles an hour coming back in. You ionize in the air particles that you're hitting initially, and that gives you this glow. Then, then the, uh, you bite into the air a little deeper and the air thicker and more higher density. This red trail follows you, fire, fiery red trail. And I had a nice uh, uh, view because I was in the right seat looking out the window backwards, and they were going in with the blunt end first, so you're looking back in the trail, you're looking at the trail, and I could just watch that nice fiery trail going behind, because I really had nothing to do then, during entry except lay there. And when the vehicle was rotated to control ranging where it would hit the ocean, there'd be a little swirl pattern in that fiery trail, and gradually that, and occasionally see a little glowing particle in that trail, which might be a piece of the heat shield that had come off. But eventually that fiery trail started turning to an orange, an orange, more orangey color, and eventually down to a white, wistful, white, uh, smoky trail. And at that time, 60,000 feet, the drogue chutes came out, which stabilized the capsule, till at 10,000 feet, the main chutes come out, three big chutes. Uh, when you see those out the window, because you're looking up at them, you know then that you've, uh, you've got it made. So all you got to worry about now is hitting the ocean. But the, the, we were uh, just an interesting, we violated every specification on all, certainly all the electronic systems in the capsule. Uh, we froze the water tanks, and so for four days we, we violated all the specifications. All that came back to life, and the, the, the entry was flown automatically with the computer, with fully auto. We ended up tied with the second most accurate splash down in the program. So it just says, I, I like to kid in some of the, the reviews we had with some of the subsystem guys, particularly the guys and nav guys. I tell them they over-designed the system. <laughs> I was happy they did. <laughs> At any rate, this shows us splashed down in, uh, by Samoan Islands, and uh, we spent one night on the carrier. Uh, we were covered by Navy SEALs. And so
now we have started the sad story of that. Every one of the Navy SEALs that were involved in this recovery operation uh, later lost their lives in Vietnam. This is the capsule now being brought on board the, the hangar deck, the, the actually the elevator to get it to the hangar deck on board the Iwo Jima aircraft carrier and us are coming aboard. Now, if you visit the Saturn V today down at Johnson, uh, they've actually made a statue of this scene that's now uh, in that building at the, at the front end of the Saturn V. We just had a much delayed uh, unveiling ceremony uh, about two weeks ago. Uh, we spent, we whisked, uh, whisked to uh, some Owen Islands in a helicopter the next morning a C Air Force C-141 took us to Hawaii, where we were met here in the scene by President Nixon, who had actually flown through Houston to pick up our wives. Jack, Jack was not married, to pick up uh, Jim and my wife. And he had a ceremony there where he awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom to the Mission Control Team and uh, did the same thing for us at Hawaii. And uh, that's the, uh, the end of the, the PowerPoint.